Um, yeah, so generative modeling is a, a really, really massive field. Um, I'm going to try and fit a lot of different content uh, into this hour and a half. My strategy is really to try and give you some good intuitions, give you kind of like a big picture look at the different sort of frameworks that people have come up with for um, different for doing generative modeling, and then also provide a lot of different kind of links to papers um, and other tutorials and references. So just to start out, um, the um, basic kind of thing that maybe you've learned so far is supervised learning, uh, where you have a data set uh, and your data might contain some inputs X and some labels Y, and you want to learn a, a function mapping X to Y. Uh, another way of framing this is learning a probability distribution over the labels conditioned on some input X. So this is the kind of like traditional setup. Um, unsupervised learning, in contrast, um, really just looks at the data. So we typically don't have any labels. The goal is just to uncover some kind of hidden structure in the data. Um, so this goal is, is super vague, um, and that's kind of on purpose, really. Um, it's the, the, the end goal of what unsupervised learning is, is, is different depending on what you're trying to do. But the basic idea is to try and understand some kind of structure in your data. So generative models fit under this overall paradigm of unsupervised learning. So today we're going to be focusing mostly on parametric generative models. Um, so there's a lot of different types of non-parametric generative models. Uh, for example, in the image domain, you have models that might copy patches from training images and kind of synthesize these in different ways. I'm not going to be looking at those at all. Instead, we're going to be looking at classes of models that are parameterized by some function and want to estimate the parameters from some data set. So the basic setup is we have some data set, in this case, a data set of faces. Uh, and we have some kind of prior knowledge that we're going to inject. Um, you know, this could be as little as this is what my function class is. We could also add additional structure to our network, network whatever we want. And then uh, we're going to learn in some way, which I'll go through in a bit. But basically, the goal of learning can be framed in a couple of different ways. Um, so one thing we might want is for samples from our data set to have high likelihood under the model that we've learned. Um, so this is kind of a density estimation type framework. Um, we also might want um, samples that are synthesized from our model to reflect the structure of the data distribution. Obviously, these two things are intimately connected, but sometimes we'll actually end up optimizing more for one or the other. So just to like motivate this a little bit, um, why do we care about generative models? Um, so there's a lot of different reasons. So first, uh, generative models are really good at helping to uncover hidden structures in data sets. Um, so this is an example of uh, a paper that came out a couple of years ago called InfoGAN, um, and they learned a generative model. In this case, they trained the generative model in these little like um, chair images. Um, but in a purely unsupervised way, the model was able to uncover really high level factors like the chair pose and the chair structure and the chair width and things like this. Um, and so this, this image here just kind of shows synthesized images that are you know, varying along these different factors of variation. Uh, there's a lot of really cool image editing applications that have emerged from generative modeling in recent years. Um, so this is an example of super resolution where um, on the uh, right here we have, can you see my, oh, my cursor? Oh, no, you can't. Um, here we go. Yeah, you can. So here um, we have the original image and then here this is the sort of super res version provided by the network. Generative models can also be used um, to synthesize predictions um, of the future, given some data about the past. So here um, in the top, I'm showing some uh, predicted future frames of a video of a robot arm that's pushing around different objects on a table. Um, so models that can perform this kind of future prediction are really useful when building agents that need to kind of reason about the effects of their actions in the world. Um, People have also used these types of models to help with um, sort of exploration. You can kind of imagine being like, oh, like, you know, do I have a good idea of what's going to happen when I perform this action? If not, maybe I should try and explore this space a little bit better. Um, so density modeling is also another way of performing outlier detection. Um, so here you can imagine if you have a generative model of this like data set of street images uh, and you get some new image, you can look at the likelihood of that image under the model that you've learned um, and try and understand is this a really likely event or a really unlikely event and then use this in some other downstream application. 
generative models are also really useful tools for artists. Um, this is some really cool stuff um, that came out of a, a Google team called Magenta, um, and it's basically a, a music synthesis model. And so this is, they've, they've turned into a whole bunch of different tools that artists can use, and it's just really fun and cool. So play with that if you want. Um, okay, so now I'm just going to go into some like background material that will come up throughout the kind of course of this talk. Um, so uh, KL divergence is a measure of how of how far apart two distributions are. Uh, it's not a proper distance metric, so it's not symmetric, um, but it does kind of measure the the difference between two distributions. Um, and the reverse KL, so you can see in the top and bottom here, we have uh, KL of P and Q, and then on the bottom we have KL of Q and P. Um, and these are two different ways of measuring distances between different distributions. And I bring it up here because um, you can see that the different distances um, sort of emphasize different things. So if Q is our model and P is our data distribution, then optimizing the forward KL, the one on the top, is going to emphasize that our model kind of puts density everywhere the data lies. Um, and you can see in this case here, the, the data is uh, multimodal and the model, this Q that we're fitting is you know, unimodal. And so we end up kind of putting density where there is none in the data distribution. Um, and then in contrast, if we were to optimize the reverse KL, um, we might actually sacrifice one of these modes um, because the reverse KL is not gonna wanna put any density where there is none. Um, so we might end up with higher quality samples if we were sampling from this model because we wouldn't end up sampling from regions where there is no data, um, but we may drop a mode. So I'm just throwing this out here because it'll come up later when we're talking, and this is a good intuition to have. Um, and then the Jensen-Shannon divergence is a third divergence that'll come up throughout. Um, and this is a symmetric distance metric. Um, it also tends to emphasize um, not putting any density where there is no data at the expense of dropping modes. Okay, so another thing that's gonna come up is this difference between explicit and implicit models. Um, so uh, likelihood-based methods, also known as prescribed probabilistic models, um, typically provide an explicit parameterization of a log likelihood function. And uh, parameter estimation here proceeds in a very standard way that I'm sure you've learned through it, the you know, earlier parts of the summer school. Uh, we just do maximum likelihood estimation. So we're estimating the parameters that maximize the likelihood of the data that we have access to through our training set under this model that we've defined. In contrast, implicit probabilistic models um, don't need to uh, define an explicit likelihood function. Instead, they just define a sampling procedure. And the intuition here is that we're gonna learn uh, this, this uh, generative distribution by just comparing samples from our generated distribution and the training distribution that we have access to. So another concept I wanna introduce is the idea of latent variables. So at an intu intuitive level, latent variables can be thought of as explaining the structure in a given data instance by some latent variable z. So throughout all of this, I'm going to use x to refer to the data. Um, this is referred to as observed because we have access to it at training time. And then z is going to refer to these latent variables, these sort of unobserved factors that um, sort of are, are causally related to the things in the world. So Again, the idea is that like these are going to describe the underlying factors of variation in your data set. So if you have a data set of faces, as described here, you might refer to the factors of variation as things like you know, lighting conditions, the pose of the face, hairstyle, identity of the person, things like that. And the idea is that these latent variables are going to kind of um, concisely represent those different factors of variation in your data set. So another relevant concept is directed generative models. Um, so throughout this entire talk, I'm only going to talk about directed generative models, um, but I want to bring it up because it's not the only type of generative model that exists out there. Um, basic idea with directed generative models is that it's a sort of family of, of probability distributions um, that represents random variables in terms of conditional probabilities. Um, and so here, if we have Z, our latent variables, we can think of this directed model of we have a likelihood over Z, and then we have the probability of X given Z. And we could have a whole chain of variables going down if we had you know, Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4, and so on. Um, and so the basic idea of directed generative models, and this is going to come up through most of the models that we work through today, we have some prior distribution over our latent variable Z, 
Um, typically, um, this prior distribution is going to be defined as something that is tractable. Um, a really common choice is just a diagonal Gaussian. Um, there's lots of more sophisticated choices you could make, but in most of the examples that we're going to work through today, we're just going to assume simple Gaussian. And then um, this P theta of X given Z, this is typically referred to as an observation model. Um, and so this model here, again, is typically taken to be something that is um, tractable, um, easy to compute, easy to sample from. Um, and it's in all of the cases we're gonna look through here, this is gonna be parameterized by a deep neural network. And this kind of sampling procedure where you first sample a latent code from the prior distribution and then sample uh, a data instance from this observation model um, conditioned on this latent uh, variable, um, that's called ancestral sampling. Um, so don't worry if this is all really fast, we're gonna kind of come back to it throughout, but just wanna like plant the seeds. Um, and then, so another thing that uh, we might think about doing with, with uh, generative models is actually um, trying to infer, given some data instance, what are the latent variables that caused um, this data instance. Um, so this distribution here, uh, P of uh, Z given X, is typically referred to as the posterior distribution over the latent variables. Um, it's often really hard to um, do this um, exactly as we'll see throughout our models. Um, but this can be useful, for example, if you like train a generative model and then you want to actually use the latent space that you've learned um, for some downstream task, maybe some discriminative task, maybe some kind of clustering task, what, or so forth. So, cool. So that's all the kind of like background stuff that we need to know. Now, um, basic idea, we have a data set, we have a parametric model, um, P theta, um, and there's a couple questions we might ask, right? So we can say like, you know, how are we actually gonna represent this, this, uh, this probability? Like what is the function class we're gonna use? Uh, and how are we gonna actually learn the parameters? Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of different sort of goals that we might have moving forward here, uh, right? We might want um, samples from the data set to have high likelihood under the model that we've learned. Uh, we might want samples from our model to kind of reflect the structure of the data distribution. And again, this notion of like, reflecting the structure and being good quality samples. This is often hard to quantify. Um, and then we also might care about, you know, representation learning. So this kind of comes back to, you know, often generative models are learned um, with the goal of actually learning a nice, clean, latent space that can be useful for something else. So that's something we might want to think about when we're actually training the model. Okay, so this is my attempt to kind of summarize different types of models. I've broken it up into explicit uh, density models and implicit density models. Again, the ones with an explicit density we're gonna learn through maximum likelihood estimation. Um, these implicit density models we're gonna learn by basically comparing samples from the data set and samples from our generated distribution. Um, and then within these kind of explicit density models, um, there's two classes of models. There's ones that define a tractable likelihood. So this means that um, so the, the, the log likelihood of the data under our model uh, is something that we can optimize exactly. Um, and there's a couple different examples here. Um, and then non-tractable models are ones where we, we have a likelihood function, but we can't optimize it exactly. And so we're gonna uh, rely on some kind of approximation. So of these models, these are the ones that I'm gonna, I'm gonna cover the most. Um, autoregressive models, um, flow-based models, variational autoencoders, generative adversarial networks, and mobile matching networks. Uh, I chose these because they're, you know, kind of represent for the most part the state of the art in generative modeling. You'll see them a lot. Um, and yeah, I'm gonna cover those. So cool, so I'm gonna start with variational autoencoders. So high level summary of variational autoencoders. Um, these are directed latent variable models. They rely on likelihood-based learning. Um, the exact likelihood is intractable, but we're gonna um, derive a lower bound on the likelihood. Uh, there's an efficient ancestral sampling procedure. Again, this means we sample Z from our prior and then X given Z. Um, and there's an approximate inference scheme. So just kind of pictorially what this looks like. Again, this is the generative process. This is the standard ancestral sampling. Um, and uh, this likelihood is intractable, so we're gonna optimize a bound instead. So these are what the different components look like. This prior, uh, I'm gonna take for now to just be a diagonal Gaussian. Again, you could throw in something more sophisticated, but for now, let's just assume that. Our observation model uh, is a conditional Gaussian. So um, what this means is we're gonna have some network, um, mu, which is going to take in a latent code and produce 
um, a mean. So this mean is going to be the, the same dimensionality as our data instances. Um, and then that is going to specify the parameters of our observation model, which in this case is a conditional Gaussian. You could also imagine learning the covariance matrix or just the diagonal of the covariance matrix. In this context, context I'm going to assume we don't. When people are modeling images, they typically just kind of take this as fixed, but you could also do that. Um, so a key thing that variational autoencoders do is introduce um, what's known as an approximate posterior. Um, so this Q phi is going to be an estimate of the true posterior of the latent variables given some image or given some input X. And again, this is going to be represented as a conditional Gaussian. So um, what this looks like is we have some data instance, we pass it through um, this network that's going to produce this mu and sigma, which are going to be the mean and diagonal covariance of our conditional Gaussian, uh, and that specifies this approximate posterior. So the next couple of slides, I'm going to like derive a bunch of maths, and then I'm going to go back and give some like good intuition. Because um, when I first learned variational autoencoders, I was like, this is too much math. I don't know what it's doing. And then when you actually kind of understand how it all fits together, it's a very, very simple framework um, that is applicable super widely. So bear with me as I go through this. So OK, so we have our log likelihood. Um, Again, we had these latent variables z, um, and so we can just express the, the likelihood as this um, product of the prior and the conditional distribution of the data uh, given this uh, latent variable. Um, now, all I've done here is just um, add in something that equals one. So again, this is our approximate posterior. Um, so now I am just replacing the integral over the latent variable z with an expectation, um, just kind of definition of what an expectation is. Um, so Jensen's inequality lets us pull the log inside the expectation. Um, and now we have this inequality. Uh, and now I'm really just rearranging terms. Um, and so this term on the uh, right here, um, this is just the KL divergence between the approximate posterior and the prior distribution that we have. Um, and so this, this, uh, this bound here is typically referred to as the evidence lower bound or the variational lower bound. Uh, okay, this does help. So, right. Um, so, I'm going to come back to this equation in a second and give some more intuition for what these two pieces mean. Um, this is really going to end up being like a reconstruction loss um, uh, once I kind of give the autoencoder intuition. And then this here is this uh, KL divergence between the approximate posterior and the prior. So first, um, before kind of getting into the intuition here, um, just want to like look at when this bound is tight. So um, I've just Re rewritten uh, and copied over this variational bound onto this page. Um, now I'm just um, rearranging terms, basically. Um, so now if I pull out um, the sort of multiplicative components of the logarithm, um, I get these two pieces. Uh, this piece on the right here, this is just an expectation of a constant, and so this just turns into log of x. Um, and then this here, this is just actually the KL distribution between P and Q. So just rewriting that, now we have uh, the data likelihood, uh, and we have the KL distribution between our approximation to the posterior and the true posterior. And so if we just sort of move the, the likelihood term to the other side, we see that um, this bound, so this is the thing we're going to be optimizing, this is the thing that we want to optimize, and these two things are equal when our approximate posterior equals the true posterior. Um, cool. So, so now I'm going to kind of flip it around and look at um, you know, how this is implemented with neural networks and kind of, I personally find this to be a little bit more intuitive. Um, so, cool. So, so variational autoencoders, they're named that way because of their resemblance to traditional autoencoders. Um, so just remember, an uh, autoencoder is something, I hope autoencoders were covered already. Um, basic idea with an autoencoder is you have some data instance, you encode it to some typically lower dimensional, or, um, lower dimensional space, and then you reconstruct that. And you typically have some kind of reconstruction error, for example, mean squared error um, in your input space. So um, variational autoencoders look very, very similar to this. Um, and we can also kind of think of them as a stochastic and regularized version of an autoencoder. Um, so here we have um, the observation model. So again, we have this prior distribution which we sample from. Um, we're going to have some uh, network which will be um, our encoder network, and it's going to. Um, uh, oh, 
is our decoder network, uh, and it's going to produce the mean of uh, a Gaussian distribution, and then we can sample from that distribution. And our recognition model, which we're also going to refer to as the encoder model, here we have some data sample. We have an encoder which produces the mean um, and diagonal variance of a conditional Gaussian distribution, and then we can sample from that. So just to write this out in a way that kind of maps it back to autoencoders, right? We have our input. Um, we get mean and variance. This defines our approximate posterior distribution. We can take a latent code. This could either be sampled from our approximate posterior or sampled from the prior. Um, we decode this, and then we get our distribution over uh, data instances. So again, recall this uh, likelihood term. So we had this reconstruction term and this prior term. Um, so I'm just going to kind of look through like what uh, go through what this looks like. So. Um, uh, Right, so the prior term, actually let me go through some tricks first and then I'll come back to this. So, yeah. How did you learn the variance at the decoder level? At the decoder level? Um, so in most cases we don't do it, but uh, so if you don't do it, then this is really just going to reduce to a mean squared error. Um, but if you do learn it, then you can just back propagate through this still. Not, like not, not, yeah, so in this example here, it's fixed. Um, yeah, you could learn it the way that you learn this one, um, which I'll, I'll get to like how you actually learn this one. Um, but in this case, I'm just going to treat it as fixed. Um, I'm doing this because I mostly work with images, and when people work with image data sets, they just kind of don't bother with this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, also, the kind of intuition here I think is nice and easy if this is fixed because then. The, uh, the likelihood of, uh, of X under this model, it's a Gaussian, and so everything else just kind of falls away, and you just have this kind of mean squared error, so it's a kind of nice intuitive mapping onto um, autoencoders. Um, but you could totally learn it, and I'll describe sort of how you learn it in this case, and that kind of copies over. Um, cool, so oh yeah, uh, here I'm saying this kind of reduces to mean squared error. Um, cool, so, um, so optimizing, okay, yeah, so here, this term here is really easy to compute with a Gaussian, um, but actually optimizing um, this expectation uh, is a little tricky. Um, so some cool tricks were proposed a couple of years ago, um, which is referred to as the reparameterization trick. So the idea here is to rewrite the random variable z as a deterministic function of another random variable. Uh, in this case, I'll call it epsilon. So um, this is just kind of a generic example of what this would look like. Um, in the Gaussian case, um, we can rewrite um, our random variable as the mean. So this is the mean output by our network, um, plus this kind of diagonal covariance term uh, multiplied by a zero mean um, uh, Gaussian variable. So now this means that this expectation that we want to optimize, um, we can actually rewrite it in terms of this um, epsilon variable. So what this means now is that um, this reconstruction term is really easy to optimize. Um, and, um, and then this, the expectation here, uh, this expectation here, we just take Monte Carlo samples. Uh, in practice, people often just do like one sample. Um, but there are lots of extensions that kind of look at optimizing this better than that. But for now, let's just assume one sample. Um, OK, so now kind of going back to this autoencoder framework, um, the two different pieces of the loss term look like this. So here we have our KL loss, right? So we have our encoder. We output this mean and variance. Um, and this KL uh, term, uh, if our prior is Gaussian, this is just uh, can be computed analytically, and we can get the, the gradients directly. Um, this is also easy for a, 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 a larger family than just a Gaussian distribution, but it's very easy and simple there. Um, and then the second part of our loss function uh, is this reconstruction term. Um, and again, this essentially kind of boils down to an L2 loss here. Um, and so again, a nice kind of intuition here is that you have this, this basic kind of autoencoding framework here, plus this additional um, kind of regularization term. That's one way of thinking of it. And so these two losses, really, they're going to be kind of like fighting one another, right? Um, because um, in order to um, as effectively as possible reconstruct an image, you're going to want to stick as much information here as possible. Um, and, and so this term here is kind of pushing this distribution to be a zero mean Gaussian, um, which is essentially regularizing. And so these two terms are kind of going to be in opposition. Um, 
Cool, so there's a lot of different um, extensions of variational autoencoder models. Just gonna like stick a couple of references here, right? So we have some sequential models. Um, these models all kind of do basically the same thing. Um, they differ mostly in the way in which they represent the prior. Um, so in all the examples that I was kind of working through so far, we had a fixed Gaussian prior. Uh, if you have time series data, you can imagine instead of having a fixed Gaussian prior, actually learning the prior at each time step um, and having that depend on either previous data instances or previous states of your RNN, stuff like that. Uh, and there's a lot of different applications here, um, right? So kind of like modeling speech and handwriting and natural language, um, music generation. This is another cool thing that came out of um, Magenta. Um, and uh, yeah, video generation, anomaly detection, lots of things. Um, so um, another kind of useful extension of a VAE is called the beta VAE. Um, and so the basic idea here uh, is to just introduce this new term, uh, which weights the KL term, um, and higher weights will encourage um, increasingly disentangled representations in the latent code. Um, and so here, disentanglement refers to sort of each uh, component of the latent code kind of representing a different sort of semantically meaningful property of the image. Uh, and this can be useful, um, again, if you want to use this latent space for some kind of downstream task, if you want to do um, maybe nice controlled generation of images um, or of your, whatever data instances you're working with. Um, so this is a cool framework for that. Um, the VQVAE is a vector quantized VAE, so this extends the basic VAE framework to discrete latent codes. Um, this is a really nice generative model. Um, gets pretty good sort of um, uh, uh, image synthesis results. Um, and um, I'll say more about what an autoregressive deco decoder is later, but they use a very powerful decoder, um, but also learn a latent space. Um, and these are just some examples of uh, images synthesized by this model. So um, a lot of this talk, I'm gonna be showing you um, images because most generative models are applied in the image domain. Um, these are quite good if you haven't looked at a lot of images from models, and they were especially good in 2017. We'll see some models that do much better, but for 2017, this was like pretty cool state-of-the-art image generation stuff. Um, uh, this model was also used to uh, generate video frames. Um, so this is a nice thing. This is an example of kind of using a generative model for some cool downstream task. They learned this model and then once they had this nice latent space, uh, they trained a sequential model in that latent space um, as opposed to training this generative model in pixel space. Um, and then they can sort of synthesize these latent codes and then they have this decoder that maps down to images. Um, so that's a cool thing. Okay. so. Uh, I'm going to go into a different type of generative model now, um, referred to as autoregressive models. So high level summary, autoregressive models, um, they are fully observed models. Um, so this is in contrast to latent variable models. Um, and I'll get a little bit more into what that means in a second. Um, it's a likelihood-based learning method. Um, so in contrast to VAEs where we had a likelihood function but we couldn't optimize it directly and so we derived this lower bound, um, autoregressive models um, define a tractable density basically by specifying an ordering on the variables uh, and then modeling a product of conditional distributions. Um, sampling um, can be slow because it is this iterative process. Um, there's no latent representation, so this, is, this comes from the fact that it's a fully observed model. Um, and they can be slow to train sometimes, although there's lots of different sort of efficient implementations. Um, cool, so as I said, likelihood-based method, um, and so um, we're gonna see that we can specify this, um, specify the model so that this can be optimized exactly. Um, the basic idea, we have our data instance X, which we can break up into different sort of dimensions, X1 to Xn, um, and we're gonna define an ordering on the components of X. Um, and so, basically just based on rules of probabilities, we can rewrite P of X as this product of all of these different conditionals, right? So we have this ordering and then we have P of X1, P of X2 given X1, P of X3 given X1 and X2 and so on and so forth. Um, so what this looks like in kind of graphical model form, right, is we have each of these, each of these variables depending on the previous one. Um, and this kind of sequential sampling procedure where we first, you know, sample our X1 from some prior distribution over X1 and then subsequently sample uh, components of our, our data um, given previous components. 
Cool. So I'm just going to kind of quickly go through like a history of different models here, just so you kind of like have lots of different references if you want to go look up on your own. Um, this is an early autoregressive model. Uh, it showed pretty promising results on uh, low resolutions. Um, it has a feed forward architecture, though. Um, as we'll see, we'll get into um, convolutional architectures and recurrent architectures. Um, this is a very simple architecture, and so it kind of had limited expressive capability. Um, this was a specifically designed architecture to enforce the autoregressive property, um, and they, they applied it basically in an autoencoding framework, um, and it, it, it made it a lot more efficient to compute because of these masks. Um, okay, so now we're getting into a little bit more um, modern and powerful autoregressive models. So um, pixel RNN, this is a deep generative model of images. Uh, the pixels are ordered in this kind of raster scan manner. So if this is an image, this is the kind of ordering like this. So like, you know, left to right, top to bottom. Um, and then each pixel is generated conditioned on previous pixels. Um, and so these are some examples of um, sort of image completions. Um, and again, for 2016, this was pretty powerful. Um, also relevant, they model pixels as a discrete distribution. Um, as opposed to continuous, so VAEs, we're looking mostly at continuous distributions, although you can do kind of binary distributions there. Um, so then um, an extension of this is the pixel CNN. So this is very similar in that we, again, we have this kind of like raster scan ordering of pixels, um, but now we introduce this convolutional model and they introduce masked convolutions in order to preserve the pixel um, order that's important to have this autoregressive property. Um, and so what this means is kind of like generating this pixel here, um, it sees this kind of like region around it, but it doesn't get to see anything kind of to the right and below it. Um, so video pixel networks, um, basically an extension of pixel CNNs to um, a recurrent video predictor. Um, and these produce pretty good results, um, again, sort of in 2016. Um, WaveNet, this is a really cool extension. So this is very similar to um, Pixel CNN, um, but it's applied to 1D audio um, signals. Um, and so I think this was applied mostly to speech, but you could also apply it to music and stuff like that. Um, so it's a fully convolutional neural network. Um, the convolutional layers have a dilation factor, and this kind of allows the uh, receptive field to grow um, basically exponentially. It makes it um, much more efficient. Um, actually, here's, I think I have a picture of the dilation. Oops. There we go. Um, and basically you can think of like a dilated convolutional neural network as like a convolution that is like, it's a very, very wide receptive field, but lots of kind of holes within it. So it can um, very efficiently, in this case, capture sort of long-term temporal dependencies, but do it in a very efficient manner. Um, so this is another cool model. I'd look it up. It's, it's, it's fun. It's cool. Um, and it could be applied to a lot of different kind of 1D um, uh, uh, signals. Okay, so normalizing flows. So this is the next class of generative models that we're gonna look at. Um, this also fits within um, this kind of likelihood-based methods um, where we have uh, a tractable likelihood that we're gonna optimize. So high-level summary, um, directed latent variable model. Um, so similar to the VAE, uh, likelihood-based learning. Um, again, we're gonna, um, We'll see we can define the likelihood in a way that um, uh, allows for exact optimization of the log likelihood. So this is similar to the autoregressive models where we optimized exactly in contrast to the VAE where we had to derive this bound. Um, and there's going to be a really efficient ancestral sampling procedure, very similar to VAEs. Um, we have exact inference here. Um, so in contrast to the um, autoregressive models where there was no inference mechanism because there was no latent variable. Um, uh, here we have exact inference and again the, the VAE, there's an inference mechanism there but it's approximate. So here it's going to be exact. Um, the one kind of downside is that these can be slow to train. Um, cool, so the basic tool um, that we're going to use here uh, is called normalizing flows. Um, and so normalizing flows are basically a tool for constructing um, complex uh, distributions um, by transforming a probability density through a series of invertible mappings. So I found this nice little graphic here, um, which I like, and basically it shows, um, you know, we sort of apply a sequence of invertible transformations. So F1 um, to Fn, these are all gonna, or Fk in this case, sorry, 
um, these are all going to be a sequence of invertible transformations. And so um, if we think in our kind of generative model space, we can have some uh, prior distribution over our latent codes, again, something nice and simple. And then we can apply a sequence of transformations in order to get um, this distribution over our data instances. So the kind of like two key concepts we need to understand um, normalizing flows uh, is the idea of Jacobian of a determinant um, and change of variables theorem. So just really quick kind of linear algebra refresher. Um, Jacobian matrix is the matrix of first order partial derivatives. Um, the determinant is, uh, it's one real number. Um, it's computed as a function of all the elements uh, in any square matrix, um, only exists for square matrices, um, and it sort of intuitively is, is often described <laughs> as, uh, bless you, uh, <laughs> as how much um, sort of multiplication by that matrix um, expands or contracts space. Um, and so um, we're gonna be looking at the Jacobian determinant of these kind of functions F that we use to transform these, um, these variables. Um, and then, okay, the change of variables there, I'm just kind of kind of state it here and then use it. Um, this basically tells us how to infer um, the unknown probability density function of a new variable, um, in this case, uh, P of X, um, given that we know P of Z. So we know P of Z, uh, G theta is um, some deterministic function of Z. Um, we'll see later we can actually write, you know, G theta as a sort of series of transformations um, and the change of variable theorem just lets us kind of write this um, uh, likelihood term in terms of uh, the, oops, sorry, this should say Z, this is wrong. <laughs> um, this should say Z because this doesn't make sense. Um, cool. So just kind of working through this uh, in our generative model. Um, so the generative process, we have this prior, um, again, exact same thing as the variational autoencoder. Um, this differs from the variational autoencoder in that um, with the VAE, we actually had this observation model. Um, here, uh, G theta is just going to be a deterministic function of Z. Um, so if you want to, you could imagine our observation model as being like a um, sort of direct delta function on like one point. Um, and then again, likelihood-based method. So we're optimizing the log likelihood with respect to theta. Um, so, right, this is just kind of repeating what I had, except now we have the correct Z here. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna kind of walk through the different components of the slide, because this kind of explains everything you need to know about flow-based generative models. So we begin with an initial distribution P of Z, um, and we're gonna apply a series of invertible transformations. So um, we have this function F, um, and uh, you know, we can write, we can basically write it as this like series of functions. And so the relationship between X and H1 and H1 and H2 and H2 and, and Z um, is each of these individual functions. Um, and so this is just exactly what I wrote before, except now I'm kind of separating out each of these different layers. Um, so it's useful to kind of think of it in terms of these sort of compositions um, of, of transformations because we're going to build this um, with a big neural network. Um, and so this means that we just kind of need um, a certain kind of property to be held for each of these individual components of our network. Um, so this is just exactly what we were doing before with the change of variables theorem, just expanding it out to this kind of sequence here. Um, and so what we need in order to do this is for um, each of these functions, fi, to be easily invertible um, and for the determinant of Jacobian to be easy to compute. So there's a lot of different kind of flow-based generative models that have been proposed. I'm just gonna kind of point to a couple of them. Um, so this is an early one, um, nonlinear independent uh, component estimation. Um, and this basically stacked a sequence of um, invertible transformations. They were called additive coupling layers. Um, this real uh, NVP model built upon this. Um, this uh, the main kind of distinction is they um, changed additive coupling layers to um, affine coupling layers um, by adding like a scale parameter. Um, and then they also introduced a multi-scale architecture, uh, which allowed for more efficient models of large images. So these are some examples of images generated um, from this model, um, which again at the time was quite impressive. Um, and then more recently, this is a cool model, um, GLOW. Um, this basically builds upon the real NVP model, um, but it introduces invertible uh, one by one convolutions um, and it ends up with like a pretty efficient architecture. It also kind of pulls upon the multi-scale stuff of this real NVP. Um, and 
now we end up with um, some really nice images. So now with this model, we're kind of getting into like the current gener generation of generative models um, where we're having like really, really good um, image synthesis results. So um, this model, we can also do cool things like interpolate between real faces. Um, so this is an example of why an exact inference mechanism is nice, um, because with an exact inference mechanism, you can take a real face, encode it into latent space, and end up with like, you know, these three latent codes here, and you can take this real face and code it into latent space and end up with these three latent codes here, then you can just do linear interpolation in that latent space. Um, and this kind of smooth linear interpolation in latent space corresponds to a very nonlinear transformation in pixel space, but this very kind of semantically meaningful type thing. Um, and so, you know, you can uh, interpolate between different celebrities. It's kind of freaky. <laughs> Um, so in this model here, they also introduced this kind of temperature parameter, um, which basically um, sort of specifies the variance of the, the Gaussian that you're going to be sampling from. And so um, if you kind of uh, sample closer to the mean, you end up with basically the same face. Um, and then as you change the temperature parameter, you get increasingly diverse faces, but also like increasingly terrifying faces. Um, so this this model it's like i don't know these faces maybe are where you want to be um but this is one i've played around this model a little bit um and one of the um one of the downsides is that in order to get kind of really nice quality results you end up having to sacrifice diversity a little bit um so some extensions of this stuff here this is a flow-based generative model for video um this is just all of these video models kind of use these robot arms that push around objects on a table. So any video examples that I show are basically just gonna do this. Um, okay, so generative adversarial networks. So now we're gonna be getting into a different class of generative models um, that uh, don't rely on uh, maximum likelihood um, estimation. Um, so I'm gonna kind of expand this out a little bit. Um, and uh, this, um, so there's a nice paper here, which I would, I'm not gonna like cover too much of it, but I think this is kind of nice um, further reading to kind of understand the difference between these kind of likelihood-based approaches and these implicit uh, density modeling approaches. Um, I'll talk about a little bit of the stuff that they do, but I think this is just kind of good reading if you're interested in generative models. Um, so the intuition with implicit generative models is, instead of doing this maximum likelihood estimation where you are optimizing your parameters so that your data has high likelihood under your model, um, instead you, you say, I don't, even, I don't even care about a likelihood function at all. I don't need it. I could have it, but I'm not gonna use it. Um, and in, in all of these cases, the generative adversarial networks and normal matching networks, we just aren't gonna have it. Um, um, and instead, what we have access to is this generative process. Um, and the idea is that training is gonna proceed by comparing um, sets of images essentially between um, the data distribution that you have access to through your training set and images sampled from your generative model. Um, and these different sorts of approaches, um, moment matching networks, generative adversarial networks, F divergences, I'm gonna talk about very briefly. This is kind of a, a broader class of, of learning metrics and generative adversarial networks can kind of fall under these under certain circumstances. Um, but basically all of these approaches kind of learn through this comparison approach. So, I think that's just a repeat of the same slide. Oh wait, no, <laughs> now I'm gonna go into generative adversarial networks. So, cool. So generative adversarial networks, I'm gonna spend a decent amount of time on because they're used everywhere now. Um, this is a slide that I took from another talk, which I really like. So this is the number of um, GAN papers by month. Um, starting in 2014 up until, I don't know, this was maybe 2018. So like just huge, huge exponential spike. So again, like this is also a huge area. Um, a lot of these papers are different kind of like tricks and techniques to improve stability of training. Some of them are defining new loss functions that are slight variants of the original ones. Some of them are applications. There's just so much here. Um, so I'm gonna, I've tried to be like a little bit selective and give like a good overarching kind of view of what GANs um, do, a tiny bit of theory, and then um, some extensions that are um, being proposed in the last couple of years. So um, just to sort of show, I've shown a lot of images so far. So this, 
this kind of shows the progression of generative adversarial networks from 2014 up until 2018. So these are all synthetic faces. Um, none of these are, are, are real people. Um, and this shows, so in 2014, when GANs were originally developed, this is, this was kind of like state-of-the-art generative modeling of faces at that time. Um, it's generative modeling of images is really, really hard. Um, and then we can see, you know, just a couple of years later, um, this is from the style GAN, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but now we're able to get, you know, super, super high resolution, um, detailed, like high quality image synthesis. So, okay, quick summary. Um, so GANs. Again, directed latent variable models. So this is the same as the flow-based models, same as variational autoencoders. Um, again, gonna have this really efficient ancestral sampling procedure where we sample a latent code and then we sample an image given that latent code. Um, I already mentioned we, it's an implicit model and so we just define the generative process um, but don't define an explicit log likelihood. Um, there's no um, inference scheme that really comes with GANs. Um, there's a lot of methods that have been proposed to do different types of approximate inference but because we just have this sort of generative process that's defined, um, there's no kind of natural inference mechanism. Um, and the one kind of key downside of GANs is that they can be super unstable. So we'll see as I go through a lot of the, um, a lot of the improvements are really just kind of trying to deal with stability issues here. So um, this is just what the generative process looks like. Um, so this is um, similar to the GLOW model, um, sorry, not the GLOW model, the flow-based model, um, where we have uh, some simple prior, and then our X is a deterministic function of that latent variable. Um, again, in contrast to the VAE, where we have some probabilistic model here, um, this is just a deterministic function. And similar to the flow-based models, if you want to think of this as a probability, you can think of it as this kind of like, you know, all the density is in one single point. Um, cool. So, um, right, no explicit density. So the intuition with GANs is that um, we're going to learn via a two-player game. So we have our generator um, that's kind of defined up here. Then we have a discriminator, and the discriminator is trained to distinguish between samples um, that come from the um, true data distribution, um, which we have access to through this training set. So the dis discriminator is going to distinguish between those real data samples and samples that come from our generative model. So you can think of the discriminator sort of as a classification model. Um, the actual loss for the discriminator um, is going to sort of change depending on the framework, but essentially it's just trying to, as best as possible, distinguish between these two sets of images. Um, and then the generator is trained to produce samples that fool the discriminator. Um, and so the training is going to kind of proceed in this kind of back and forth um, fashion where um, the generator and discriminator are constantly updating and learning. And so, you know, as the discriminator gets better at differentiating generated samples from true data samples, the generator is going to have to get better at fooling the discriminator and basically get better at producing images or data instances, um, we're not in the image domain, um, that look like real data. So. Um, what this kind of looks like in network form, we have um, this discriminator. Um, so we have, you know, kind of two cases, two types of data that the discriminator sees. Um, if it sees real data, it's basically trying to produce something close to one. Again, the exact loss function we'll get into and it'll change depending on the framework. Um, and then the discriminator, if it sees samples from the model, it's going to try and produce something close to zero. And then, so this is, if you just kind of take these two things here, this is, you know, just a simple kind of supervised training problem, basically, for the discriminator, where it gets, you know, two different types of samples. Um, and then the generator, so this kind of like Z sampled from the prior combined with the generator, this really just kind of defines our model distribution. And the generator is trained um, to make the discriminator um, think that this sample is real and so close to one. And so we'll see the way the generator is trained is basically sort of forward propagation through this network. Um, the generator has some loss function, then the gradients are going to be propagated through the discriminator and back to the generator. And so when the generator is being learned, so when the gradients are passing through here to the generator, the discriminator is going to be held fixed. Um, and then when the discriminator is learning, the generator is held fixed. So um, this is what the, the sort of originally proposed um, loss function looks like. So here we have um, 
this first term here, this is the sort of expectation under our data distribution. Um, so again, this would be like approximated with um, just samples from our training set. Um, and this is the log likelihood of um, that data from the true data distribution are considered genuine by the discriminator. Um, and then in contrast here, now we're sampling latent variables from our prior distribution, feeding them through our generator. So this G of Z here gives um, a generated sample or a fake sample. Um, and so then this here is the log probability under D that the samples from the generator are considered fake. Um, so this is really just like a, if you ignore the kind of G stuff, this is just um, D is optimizing a cross entropy, uh, binary cross entropy loss function. Um, and then uh, G here, so we have max over D, min over G. So this means that the generator is basically trying to fool the discriminator. And so the, the generator's gradient uh, comes through, it gets back propagated through G or through D. So again, as I mentioned, this is like an alternating optimization procedure. Uh, the optimum is a saddle point. Um, in the original um, kind of GAN paper, um, Ian Goodfellow um, sort of goes through the maths and shows that minimizing the uh, GAN, of uh, GAN objective function with an optimal discriminator uh, is equivalent to minimizing the Jensen-Shannon divergence. Um, again, a lot of the kind of theory around GANs holds under optimal conditions, and we are never under optimal conditions. So a lot of this stuff is kind of giving a little bit of intuition, but um, you know, we're not saying anything super precise. Um, but another sort of important intuition here. So um, earlier on at the beginning, I kind of talked about the difference between minimizing forward KL and reverse KL and Jensen's Shannon divergence uh, and what that looks like for different generative models. Um, here, um, we're minimizing the Jensen Shannon divergence. And so, actually, here's a good slide. Okay, so here we're minimizing the Jensen Shannon divergence. And if this is our data distribution, um, the Jensen Shannon divergence um, sort of encourages the model to only put density where there is actually data. Um, and so, GANs tend to, in contrast to models that optimize KL divergence, they tend to um, put um, they tend to have higher quality samples, um, but they might miss modes. So just in contrast, we'll look at this as like the KL divergence. So maximum likelihood estimation, I should have said this at the beginning, maximum likelihood estimation minimizes the KL divergence between the forward KL divergence between the um, data distribution and the model distribution. And so a lot of early um, maximum likelihood based models, typically VAEs for the most part, um, they tended to produce um, samples that were quite blurry, um, weren't as crisp and as sharp as, as GANs. Um, and one of the ways in which this was explained um, was because the KL divergence tends to emphasize like capturing all of the different modes uh, and basically putting model density anywhere the data lies. And sometimes this comes at the expense of putting density, you can see in this kind of like, well, you can't see with the pointer, in this middle area here basically, where there is no, no data, um, but the model ends up putting density there. So just kind of like a little bit of intuition for like, the different trade-offs of these models. And then this, this paper that I'm citing here, this, this image comes from this paper. Um, I would also just recommend reading this. It uh, kind of gives some good um, intuition for the different types of things that might be optimized in different generative models. Um, cool, so, um, okay. So the first loss function that I showed a couple slides ago, um, that actually provides really poor gradients early on in learning. Um, when the discriminator is really certain. Um, and so in the same initial GAN paper, um, Ian Goodfellow also proposed this alternative objective. Um, so this, uh, this is more commonly used. Um, it's often referred to as the non-saturating uh, uh, GAN loss. So basically D's objective doesn't change at all. Um, but the generator's objective changed. So in the original objective, the generator was just trained to minimize this function. And so G only really shows up in this part. And so G was trained to minimize this here. Um, in contrast, this new function, uh, G is trained to maximize this here. So what this looks like in practice is uh, the discriminator has um, real images labeled with label one, fake images or synthetic images labeled with label zero. It's trained with the binary cross entropy loss to distinguish between those two um, sets of examples. And then the generator, now what we do if we were implementing this is we would just 
flip the label of generated images from zero to one for when we're optimizing the generator, um, feed that through the discriminator with this kind of flip label, get the gradients in the discriminator and update the generator based on that. Um, so, so this is when most of the time when people just say they're using like a standard GAN loss, this is, this is what they're using as opposed to that previous version. Um, cool. So, let's see. So there's a lot of different um, challenges that come with generative adversarial networks. Um, there's a huge, huge, huge amount of literature um, that people have, have developed trying to understand properties of GANs, trying to um, provide some kind of sort of theoretical understanding of, of why they work when they do and why they fail when they don't. Um, so I'm going to try and give some intuition here, but then also um, there's a lot of different things you could read. So this, um, I found this um, like blog post, um, which I thought was quite nice. Um, uh, WGAN is a Wasserstein GAN. I'm going to go into that specific model in a second, um, but this is just generally kind of like a, a good um, blog post that I would read. Um, so, cool. So this paper from 2017, um, this is another, um, I think, really uh, insightful and useful GAN paper to read. Um, and they kind of go through a couple different um, sort of problems with the, the typical GAN training procedure, um, looking at kind of stability stuff. So, um, so the first thing that they observe is that um, both the data and the, the generative distributions are very likely lie on low dimensional manifolds. Um, and so, so what this means basically, so this is three dimensional space um, and really like a one dimensional or two dimensional manifold. And so uh, if these sort of, you know, red and, and blue lines or, or planes are our generative and uh, data distributions, um, they, they really don't intersect very much. Um, they might be entirely disjoint or there might be a very, very small region of space where they intersect. Um, and so this paper here kind of talks about how that, that's really challenging for GAN training because it means that you can actually like find a discriminator um, that kind of can perfectly distinguish um, between the generative distribution and uh, the true data distribution. Um, and so this means that um, you know, if you have this kind of perfect discriminator, um, then it's, it's gradients, um, the, the generator is basically going to get like zero gradients everywhere. And so this isn't super useful. Um, so um, this, is, this is an experiment. This is a plot from the same paper where basically, um, so I, I kind of said earlier, a lot of the like nice theoretical results from GANs um, come under the conditions of like an optimal discriminator. Um, but in this paper, they actually sort of look and they say like, okay, if we actually have an optimal discriminator, um, this is actually really bad for the generator because um, of this vanishing gradient problem. And so what they did here is they, they basically um, continued to train the discriminator um, for increasing amounts and then looked at the uh, gradients that the generator got um, for each of those discriminators. So here it's like, as we move along the x-axis, the discriminator is getting better. Um, and then this is, um, this is the norm of the gradient. And we see that it actually degrades. And this is, I believe, a, yeah, it's a log scale. Um, and so, so this is, this is kind of, this is problematic. Um, and this is this weird kind of like dilemma that GANs face where, you know, if the discriminator is really bad, um, then it's like not giving good feedback for the generator. Um, but if the discriminator is really good, then the, the generator might not be getting enough signal from the discriminator. Um, and so there's a lot of different things that people have kind of been proposing over the years to deal with this. So instance noise um, is one example. Um, so this has been proposed in a couple of different papers um, early on. I actually don't think it's used that much now, but it's kind of an interesting sort of, you know, historic, yeah. Yeah, so, um, in the traditional loss function here, um, because we have this log, this is going to saturate. So if the discriminator is super, super certain, um, so if the discriminator is really, really good and it's super confident in doing a really good job of discriminating real samples from fake samples, it's just going to saturate um, because of this log here. So this was one way of kind of dealing with that. And then we're going to see a, a lot of different ways of trying to deal with that. So the, yeah, sorry, the like the log function just kind of plateaus at a certain point. And so there's like no more signal once you reach a certain point. 
Yeah, so I think what you're referring to is um, called label smoothing. Um, so in the traditional sort of GAN framework, you have labels of zero and one for sort of synthetic and fake data and real data. Um, something that was proposed, I think, in this paper called like improving training of GANs, I think it's a 2016 paper, they proposed label smoothing, um, which is basically instead of giving zero one labels, either give like noisy labels um, or give labels of like 0.9 and 0.1 um, so that you end up kind of like smoothing at this distribution a little bit. And that does help a little bit. Um, this, uh, this instance noise is another thing that was proposed. And the idea here uh, is basically just to add a small amount of continuous noise to the generated images before they go into the discriminator, um, just kind of help smooth out the generator distribution. Uh, and there's a little bit more sort of theoretical underpinnings of this um, in, uh, in, again, in this, this paper here. And this was also proposed in another paper. Um, and so then there's also a lot of work moving from cost functions, um, moving to cost functions that don't have vanishing gradients. And so I'll, I'll talk about like a little bit of those. Um, and, oh yeah, so this is also relevant. So another thing that um, very frequently happens with GANs um, is referred to as mode collapse. Um, and the idea here is that at some point in training, the generator just kind of collapses and starts producing a very small set um, of images. Um, and so it might be a single image, it might be a small set of images, but basically it's images that like, look like total garbage if you're looking at them. They don't really reflect the data distribution, um, but they're fooling the discriminator still. Um, and sometimes you'll see this kind of cyclic behavior where uh, the generator will kind of, you know, produce this set of images here and then the discriminator will catch up and, um, you know, start to be able to discriminate those, but then it'll shift over to this other set here. Um, and this is a, a really common thing um, that happens. Um, so, this, this figure here is just kind of describing that. So this is like, if this was, so this, this figure here comes from this unrolled GAN paper, um, which is a cool GAN architecture. It's not, it's not really used much that I know of now, um, but it's kind of a, I don't know, theoretically pleasing type thing. I'll explain it in a second. But first, um, this, uh, uh, um, this, so this is our target distribution, right? We have all these um, different sorts of modes here. Something that might happen throughout training is this is the generative distribution at different time steps in training. And we can see um, the generator kind of hops around to the different modes. Uh, and so intuitively you could imagine that like, you know, the generator kind of gets this mode and it's fooling the discriminator really well, but then all of a sudden the discriminator realizes that like, you know, oh, actually this kind of looks like the training data. And so the generator hops to another mode and it just kind of moves around. Um, and, and so this is, you know, this is a very toy example of that, but you, you tend to see this a lot um, when you're training GANs. Um, so this unrolled GAN basically um, kind of proposed that the generator actually take into account um, the discriminator's gradient. Um, and so the unrolled kind of refers to like um, optimizing through both of the different objectives. So another thing that has been proposed is to use um, batch statistics. Um, so um, the idea here, this was kind of proposed in different ways in a couple of different papers, um, but the idea is instead of uh, the generator, sorry, instead of the discriminator just seeing um, single instances, it actually gets to see a large set of instances um, at each time. Uh, and so you can implement this by just giving the discriminator access um, to all of the images in a batch, for example. And so now the discriminator can see if, um, you know, there's a huge amount of diversity in the real data set in these, you know, say 100 images in the batch, um, but the 100 images that are coming from the generative distribution um, have very, very limited diversity then it can easily distinguish between these two distributions. Um, and then generator conditioning is another thing that I'll, I'll get into in a little bit, but this has also um, been observed to um, help with mode collapse. So, cool. Um, so another challenge of GANs, um, and I'll get into this a little, in a little bit, um, is just kind of like evaluation criterion. So with likelihood-based methods, um, there's a clear loss function that you are optimizing and it goes down as you train, or hopefully it goes down. And if it doesn't go down, then you know there's something wrong. Um, in contrast, um, 
most GAN frameworks are kind of optimizing. It's this alternating optimization procedure. The optimum might be a saddle point. Um, the actual like value of the loss function doesn't tell you that much. Um, and so uh, this can make it really tricky when you are you know, trying to decide what a good stopping criterion is, um, when you want to do model comparison, um, when you just want to like run a giant hyperparameter sweep and pick your best model, like this becomes really, really challenging. And so you'll see, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of papers in this area kind of rely on like, you know, human evaluations or like handpicked samples and stuff like that. Um, I'll go into some different evaluation metrics that have been proposed that kind of capture different things in a little bit, but this is, I think, still like a pretty um, open problem. Um, okay, so as I said, there's a ton of different GAN losses. This is not even like half of them. Um, this was just a nice table that I grabbed from this paper. Um, there's so many different versions. So um, this is the original kind of GAN objective that I proposed. This NS GAN is the non-saturating GAN, which is used very much in practice. I'm gonna go through the W GAN, which is the Wasserstein GAN, and the W GAN GP, which is the Wasserstein GAN with the gradient penalty. Um, there's way more, like this table should actually go on forever because there's so many different variants that have been proposed. Um, I, I'm i gonna um, go through the Wasserstein GAN because um, it is used quite frequently. Um, I use it, I like it. Um, it's fairly stable um, and um, yeah, that's enough justification. <laughs> so, cool. Um, okay, so just really briefly, I'm going to give some intuition for the Wasserstein metric, um, which is what the Wasserstein GAN um, uses. So again, this is, uh, I think I might have referenced this earlier, um, or maybe not. Anyway, this is a cool blog post. I took all these figures or like augmented these figures from this blog post because I liked it. And when I was learning about this metric, which I didn't know before I learned about Wasserstein GANs, I read this and it was useful. So um, the Wasserstein distance is the minimum cost of transporting mass. Um, when converting um, one probability distribution into another. So in this case, we can think of like, you know, our, our uh, uh, model distribution and our data distribution and the kind of cost of transporting mass there. So I'm just gonna go through a really toy example, which will hopefully give some intuition. Um, but basically you can think of, you know, we have KL divergences, that's a way of measuring distances between distributions. This is another type of uh, way of measuring distances. So um, basically, in this toy example, imagine we have a bunch of boxes. Um, you know, the number of boxes in each in each particular location. You know, in this kind of example, represents the the probability mass in this location. Um, and we want to convert this one distribution into another distribution. Um, and so we're going to do this by just kind of like moving these boxes over. And so the cost of moving a box is um, the the weight of the box, which just assume is one for now, um, and uh, multiplied by the distance. So if we were to move this box six over here, um, the, the cost would be um, seven, 10 minus three. So um, basically the Wasserstein distance is the cost of the cheapest plan. And so we can kind of define a plan um, based on sort of each of these different boxes, how we move them here. So um, I won't go into too much depth here, um, but if you go back and look at the slides or look at this blog post, it kind of like goes through this in more depth. But basically um, this um, you know, kind of plan here describes where each of the boxes here are moving. And each of these distributions are gonna be the marginal distributions. And so this is saying, you know, we had, um, actually these distributions should be flipped because we have, sorry, this is bad. Um, but here we have sort of three boxes here and then we're moving them over to these different locations here. So, um, right, so we can have a whole bunch of different plans. Each of them will have a different cost. Um, and the Wasserstein distance is the cost of the cheapest of these transport plans. Um, in this particular example here, they both cost the same, um, but you know, this is a simple example of how you know, they can cost different things. So, okay, so kind of writing this out mathematically, uh, we have our data distribution and our generator distribution. Um, and these are the different plans that we have, these gammas. Um, and then uh, this all together here is the um, uh, uh, Wasserstein metric, also called the Earth River metric. So this paper I would recommend reading. Um, this goes into so a lot of like really nice theory into why this type of metric um, makes a lot um, more sense um, when you're comparing sort of different probability distributions. Um, and a lot of the intuition here that they go through is just because um, you end up with um, 
sort of no gradients in certain places um, if you use um, KL divergence or reverse KL or Jensen Shannon, um, but you end up with gradients everywhere if you use this. And so they work through a couple of really simple toy examples there. Um, so of course this is this is intractable. Um, so of course we come up with a nice approximation. Um, so the approximation that they propose in the in the paper um, uses this duality, which I honestly don't know much about. So I'm just going to point to this blog post. Um, I haven't really seen this kind of explained much in most GAN papers. It's just kind of stated. Um, so I found this blog post, and I would encourage you to look at this blog post because. I can't teach that. Um, so cool. So this. So now, because of this duality, um, we have this. Um, uh, we rewritten this Wasserstein loss in this form, which looks very, very similar to the discriminator. Um, uh, sorry, to our, our GAN setup from before. So we have this expectation over data sampled from our data distribution, and this expectation over generated generated images. Um, here we have this F function, which in the you know, Wasserstein framework is typically called a critic. Um, but if we just sub in D here, then we basically have the, you know, it looks a lot like the GAN function. So um, just to kind of compare these side by side, this is the original GAN objective. This is the Wasserstein GAN objective. Um, here we now have a constrained optimization problem because we need um, this discriminator function um, uh, to <coughs> to be one Lipschitz. Um, and so the Wasserstein GAN paper originally, they enforced this through weight clipping. Um, so uh, that's not the greatest way of doing it. Um, they did get some good results. Um, and I think when that paper came out, it was state of the art um, when it was originally proposed. Um, but there's different ways of enforcing this constraint. So this Wasserstein GAN with the gradient penalty, um, this paper is much more commonly, or sorry, this formulation is much more commonly used. Um, and basically the idea here um, is just um, to enforce the constraint by adding a gradient penalty that constrains the uh, discriminator to have um, gradient norms less than one everywhere. Um, so cool, so now with this formulation, we have um, some really nice samples. So these are um, a bunch of synthesized bedroom images. Um, I always feel like people who like jump into generative models and have no context, they're always like, why are you generating bedrooms? But bedrooms are it's just a really common data set that people use in the generative model world. So that's why we're looking at bedrooms. Um, and these are, these are all synthetic images, but they're all um, pretty high quality. And so again, this was kind of state of the art when it came out. Um, okay, so another set of GAN stabilization techniques. Um, so, so far we've looked at a couple different loss functions. Um, now I'm just going to kind of stick in some different architectural improvements. These are just things to think about when you're building a GAN model. Um, so batch normalization. Um, so batch normalization um, and um, the idea of avoiding sparse gradients. Both of these ideas were initially proposed in the DC GAN paper. Uh, it came out in 2015. Um, this is just kind of an example of what that architecture looks like. Uh, and just really sort of simple tricks that just really improve training. Um, so basically batch norm works by normalizing the input features to, have a, to a layer to have zero mean and unit variance. Um, and it just really helped with um, stability. Um, it also sort of empirically helped with mode collapse a little bit. Um, and I think there was some intuition that people had that it kind of like helped deal with poor parameter initialization in some cases because batch norm is generally helpful there. Um, then uh, virtual batch norm um, is, you know, kind of a different variant here um, where uh, each example is normalized based on the statistics collected from a reference batch as opposed to in batch norm the statistics are collected for the given batch that's going through the network. Um, so yes, yeah, so this was another good thing. And then generally it's good to avoid sparse gradients. Um, so, you know, instead of using ReLUs, use leaky ReLUs. Um, and this just kind of helps improve the signal from the discriminator to the generator. Um, spectral normalization. Um, this is a more recent paper. Uh, it's a weight normalization method that um, has also been proposed, uh, proposed to uh, stabilize training. Um, and this is, you can be thought of as like, um, you know, an, an alternative to the kind of weight clipping or gradient penalties and other normalization technique. Um, this is, um, so it was originally just applied in the discriminator. Um, these synthesized images are coming from this paper. So again, now we're really kind of getting into state-of-the-art image generation stuff. These are synthetic pizzas and synthetic cats. 
because everybody loves cats and pizza, so these are good examples to show. Um, and then uh, this work later applied at both the discriminator and the generator and found it was helpful there. Um, uh, yeah, so this is a cool paper also, um, I think worth reading, um, but basically they looked at the conditioning of the Jacobian of the generator um, and uh, um, found that like, I think they found empirically that um, poorly conditioned um, uh, uh, generators and it was very predictive of the of different sorts of like uh, metrics that people use to evaluate generative models. Um, so, okay, multi-scale architecture. So now we're gonna get into some like architectural stuff. Um, so um, the idea here, there's a couple different models that have been proposed, but the basic intuition here is just kind of incremental um, growing of the GAN. And so um, you might train an initial model on very low resolution images, because it's quite easy to model low resolution images. And then um, given that model, train another model on a slightly higher resolution, conditioned on that lower resolution image, and then kind of so on and so forth. Um, progressive growing of GANs. This is another um, good paper. This is, um, I'd say also still kind of state of the art. Um, and the idea here is that we start with a low resolution image and then progressively increase the resolution, um, but this time by adding layers to the network in an incremental fashion, um, as opposed to the kind of multi-scale stuff where it's like you train one model at this resolution and then you fix that and you train another model, another resolution and add on here, the layers of the network are just kind of progressively being added in. Um, and this is nice because it allows the model sort of early on to capture very coarse grain features um, of your data set um, and then over time um, kind of focus on more fine grain details. Um, these are some samples from the progressive growing of GANs paper. Um, these are all, um, uh, synthesized faces. Um, it was trained on a data set of celebrities, um, so they all look like celebrities. I don't know. Um, these are 1024 by 1024 pixels. This is quite high resolution. Um, so long range dependencies and global structure um, still kind of remained, well, remains and remained a challenge. Um, this is getting better. But the self attention GAN. Um, was proposed as a way of kind of dealing with this. Um, and so at this point when it was um, uh, proposed, um, GANs were really good at like, you know, kind of low level textures. And they were also really good at faces that have a lot of symmetry and a lot of structure. But for just kind of generic objects, GANs would have trouble with like counting um, and just kind of put like six eyes on faces and stuff. And so you'd see images that like from far away looks like an image, but close up, not really. Um, so basically the self-attention GAN introduced um, an attention mechanism uh, to the generator and the discriminator uh, and this kind of helped learn kind of long-range dependencies and more global structure. Um, and so now with the self-attention GAN we see really kind of coherent global structure. Um, these are samples of like dogs and, and different kinds of birds and fish um, and um, yeah just like much more coherent uh, structure. Um, okay big GAN this is another good one. Um, this is another paper I'd recommend reading because this is, um, I think, state of the art right now. Um, and these, these are all synthetic images and they're really good. Um, what's cool about this paper is that they just did a bunch of really simple things. Um, so they did things like increasing the batch size. Um, uh, here's the batch size. They just like increased it and already that improved things. Um, uh, these are different kind of metrics, which I'll get into in a second. Um, and smaller is better here, larger is better here. So they increased batch size, they like doubled the number of channels in the layer. Um, they added skip connections from the noise vector. So instead of the noise vector just going directly into the generator, it would go into each layer of the generator. Um, and they had a couple different versions here. They would either give the exact same kind of noise vector at each layer or they, each layer would get a different sort of chunk of the noise vector. Um, and then they also um, saw really good results by sampling from a truncated Gaussian distribution. And the idea here is that when values sort of fall outside a particular range, you just resample within this range. Um, and um, this didn't work with every architecture because you're essentially sampling um, from a different distribution you saw during training, um, but with some other kind of tricks, they made this work. Um, and so here now we see, um, so okay, so this is the effects of that truncation. So Basically, this is similar to that glow model that I was showing earlier where you had a temperature parameter to control. Um, and so you can kind of generate very, very um, regular images or get more diversity. Uh, and you can see that like the quality of the image improves as you kind of limit the diversity. Um, but you can kind of like, you know, pick something in the middle here and it, and it looks pretty good. Um, 
And then, yeah, this is just some things that the big GAN still struggles with. So on the left, um, these are like easy classes where there's like a lot of texture or things are like, you know, centered right in the middle. It does a really good job there. Um, but generating like people and really kind of complex intricacies here, you know, we're not, we're not quite there yet. Um, Style-based generator architecture, gonna kind of rush through this, but this is another method where basically um, they kind of take techniques from style transfer, um, uh, some style transfer models and bring those into um, the generator model. Uh, and so this is basically, they're building off of the progressive GAN model, um, but just improving the generator. Um, and now we're starting to get just like kind of scary um, image generation of people, like these are all synthetic faces um, that came from the style again model. Um, and then uh, this model also does a good job on just kind of other objects. So these are like bedrooms again and cars, and we're seeing like good kind of global coherent structure. Um, cool. I'm actually gonna rush through this. There is I'm just going to point to this paper because this is again some nice theory. Um, uh, this kind of FGAN paper, they basically look at um, so F divergences are sort of class of, of, of uh, divergences, uh, again, for comparing different probability distributions. Um, and they, they show some nice theory that um, kind of unifies a lot of different um, GAN frameworks um, and other kind of implicit models within this. Um, and yeah, so just read that paper. Um, moment matching networks. Um, this is another framework. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna kind of skip through it. Similar to GANs um, in terms of the actual architecture of the model, ancestral sampling procedure, all of that kind of stuff, um, but um, stable um, because you don't have this kind of like alternating optimization procedure, um, but they haven't really caught on uh, and the samples are not amazing. Although there is some stuff where people are like combining GANs and moment matching networks, um, and you can also use this moment matching criterion as a way of evaluating GANs. So if you're interested, go read this further. Um, I'm gonna skip through here. Okay, so evaluating generative models. So this is something that I kind of skimmed over throughout. Um, so an obvious way of evaluating generative models is to look at the log likelihood. Um, again, look at the, the likelihood of your data set, typically um, a held out data set that you didn't see during training. Um, look at the likelihood of that data under the model that you've learned. Um, so this is a sort of natural way in which um, a likelihood based methods are compared with one another. Um, but um, this isn't really viable for implicit models like GANs, um, again, because there is this, there's no kind of explicit density function. Um, early works tried to leverage this kind of pars and window approach where you um, take a bunch of um, sampled images and you place a Gaussian on top of each one and you say that this mixture is your density model or an approximation to it. Um, but this doesn't really work because high dimensional spaces, um, that just it doesn't really make sense. Um, so, other things that you might care about are perceptual quality of the generations, diversity, um, whether or not your model is overfit. Overfitting is really important because, um, you know, if you just like take your training set, um, then that has a lot of diversity and the perceptual quality is really good, but that's not a great generative model. Um, um, so overfitting is really important to check. And then also, you know, utility for some kind of downstream task. That's also important depending on like why you're building the model. So um, a couple scores that people have proposed to um, uh, kind of quantify these different types of things. Um, one is the inception score. Um, so um, the idea here is like given an inception network, uh, which is a, a classification model that's been proposed, um, but you could also just take any kind of powerful classifier, but given, given some classifier, the intuition is that samples from your uh, generative distribution should have a highly peaked conditional label distribution. Um, so this means that like when I take a generative sample, pass it through this classifier, I want the classifier to be very certain about what class it is. Uh, and the intuition here is that high certainty sort of corresponds to like meaningful samples. Um, and then you also want to have a uniform marginal distribution across these labels. So this means that like, you know, given a huge set of, of uh, generated images, um, if I look at the marginal distribution over the labels from all of these, um, I'm going to kind of equally hit all of the classes. Um, and so the inception score looks at the KL divergence between these two distributions, right? Because you want one to be highly peaked, you want one to be uniform. Um, so if we look at the KL divergence, then the higher the KL, um, the more we're satisfying these two things. Um, cool. So this is um, 
This is nice um, because it gives us kind of like one single number. Um, it doesn't, some limitations are it doesn't care about uh, within class diversity. Um, so if you just generated a single instance of each class, you'd get a really high score here. Um, another limitation is that it doesn't actually rely at all on the data distribution. Um, so nowhere here am I using the data distribution when I compute this. Um, although you could imagine training the, the classifier network that you use on your data distribution if you had labels for it, and so you could kind of get it in there. Um, but it's a bit weird because it doesn't use that. Um, and then also there's no kind of measure of overfitting, right? You could just, um, you know, produ reproduce exactly uh, instances from your training set um, and you'd have a, you know, high inception score. Um, so this is what I just said. I forgot I had a slide about it. Um, uh, okay, so this is another uh, um, uh, metric that's been proposed more recently. Um, and the idea here is that we're kind of improving upon the inception score, this IS, um, because you can have a good inception score if the model generates just one image per class. Um, and so here the idea is, instead of looking at the predictions that the neural network makes, we, um, we take uh, a whole bunch of real images and a whole bunch of synthetic images, pass them through our training, or pass them through our inception network, get the mean covariance and kind of compare these statistics here. In this case, we're looking at the first and second moments. Um, and yeah, so an additional thing that we need to do, again, like looking at nearest neighbors, this is frequently done to measure overfitting. Um, nearest neighbors either in pixel space, which is like something, but you know, nearest neighbors in pixel space doesn't make a lot of sense just because we're in this very, very high dimensional space. Um, but you could also look at nearest neighbors in the embedding space from some kind of um, you know, other classifier model, for example. Um, also, human evaluations are frequently used um, where people will just kind of like, you know, get a, a batch of humans and have them look at these images and say, you know, which one is kind of perceptually um, better to you. Um, and yeah, these are some uh, good further readings on this kind of like space of evaluating models. Um, this, this is actually a good one to read. This all GAN are all GANs created equal. They basically implemented like a huge, huge number of all the different GAN training frameworks and were like, hey, a lot of the differences actually just come down to little kind of optimization things. Um, but this is a really good summary. Uh, and then also pros and cons of GAN evaluation metrics. They just go through like a huge different set of evaluating things. Um, I have two minutes left, so I'm gonna go through just some cool applications, uh, image to image translation. Um, this work here basically um, translates between different types of domains. So we can go from like, you know, uh, daytime to nighttime, or like this sketch to like an actual image of a purse. Um, unpaired image to image translation, this is cool. So this was paired, so it means that during training we needed, you know, sort of um, paired examples of this. Um, this one here, we just need two different domains, and this is cool, you know, we can kind of do this kind of style transfer stuff or turn zebras into horses. Um, face to cartoon, another cool thing where we like turn people's faces into little cartoon versions of their faces. Um, super resolution, I think I mentioned this one earlier on, but uh, this is a nice kind of image editing application. Um, generating molecular graphs. So I've been focusing a lot on images throughout this talk, but there's you know a whole lot of other domains in which you can apply these different techniques. Um, and yeah, there we go. Huh, just some time.